Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. My dog Bubba hated thunder because he didn't understand it. During thunderstorms when I was a kid, he would run around the entire house looking for a spot to hide from the sound, trying under the bed or even under the couch cushions. There was nowhere to go to avoid that booming thunder. Sometimes I would try to talk to him to explain that he didn't need to be afraid. I don't think it's weird to talk to your pets at all. Before there was an explanation for lightning and thunder, I wonder how people explained it to their kids. I guess they would talk about thunderstorms in terms of the gods getting angry and fighting with one another. That would have just scared me worse. Understanding what creates thunder and lightning doesn't make it less spectacular. Realizing lightning is a discharge of electricity doesn't diminish the majesty. To reduce lightning to simple electrical charge does nothing to explain why it flows through the air, which is not electrically conductive. Electricity is supposed to need a conductor, the right material to move around in. Air is non-conductive or electrically insulating. So how does that work? Turns out that electricity doesn't necessarily need a conductor to flow. The physics is more complicated. Electricity, a powerful, mostly invisible force of nature, all by itself, is almost magic. And then consider electricity is behind a large part of all observable physics and runs the modern civilized world. If we didn't understand electromagnetic theory and couldn't predict its behavior, electricity would certainly seem totally alive. Some might observe that we don't run electricity. Electricity runs us. If I mention the dawn of the electrical age, you might think of Ben Franklin and his historic kite flight in the famous thunderstorm in Philadelphia in June of 1752. However, Electricity had been observed and speculated about across various scientific fields leading up to that historic flight. Science had an idea of what was going on with lightning and electricity in general, but it took a few more years for James Clerk Maxwell to come along and make sense of it all. My fascination with electricity started when I was very young. And it, and it, my fascination with electricity started when I was very young, and it didn't take me very long to have my first engineering disaster and start my first fire. When I was 10 or maybe 11, I built, or rather scrapped together, electrical components from several old lamps and other appliances from around my parents' house. I rigged it all into a whole new Frankenstein lamp that I delivered to my grandmother as a present. Once it was plugged in, the fire started in the electrical cord immediately. Apparently, I didn't understand how the wire's gauge is important. I was using wire too thin to carry all the electrical current from the wall outlet. I inadvertently brought a little bit of lightning inside the house. That flash of electricity, that electrical arc left quite an impression on me. I never looked at electricity or lightning the same way. It scared me, but at the same time, I wanted to learn how to control it. I had also found out a few years earlier that lightning could be captured to power time-traveling automobiles. For as common as it is, occurring over 1.4 billion times on Earth per year, lightning is not without its mysteries. It all starts with tiny water drops and ice crystals high above the Earth in the clouds. These small particles rub against one another, creating friction and static or trilogical charging on the drops and crystals. Even water droplets can be charged with electricity. After a lot of rubbing and charging, there's a gulf of static electricity built up in the cloud with nowhere to go. The ground is just so far away. So the static electric charge just builds and builds until what's called dielectric breakdown of the air. The air molecules oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide are being twisted with such a strong electric field or voltage 
from the built-up static in the clouds that the structures themselves simply can't take it. The molecules start getting ripped into shreds or ions. The air is essentially broken by static electricity in the clouds. The shredded air molecules are very different than the intact molecules. These ions, or charged bits, can conduct electricity. When this happens, the glut of static electricity built up in the cloud goes from static to dynamic. The rush of what was once static electricity cascades down a beaten path of broken down air. Now, this static has found a path through the air. Now, it's lightning. As the massive built up electrical charge passes through the conductive ions in the air, the air becomes heated so quickly that it expands explosively, supersonically. The sound of the expanding gas around the glowing lightning strike is thunder. Science has a pretty good handle on the conventional forms of lightning out there. However, lightning can come in forms other than the garden variety, showing some very strange properties. Some classes of lightning are resistant to simple scientific explanations. Ball lightning is described as luminescent, spherical objects that vary from pea size to several meters in diameter. Some 19th century reports of this phenomenon describe balls that eventually explode and leave behind an odor of sulfur. Descriptions of ball lightning appear in a variety of accounts over the centuries. Some have even received some attention from scientists. An optical spectrum of what appeared to be a ball lightning event was published in January 2014 and included a video at high frame rate. Small-scale laboratory experiments have produced effects visually similar to reports of ball lightning, but how these relate to the actual phenomenon isn't firmly established. Infamous British occultist Aleister Crowley reported witnessing what he referred to as globular electricity during a thunderstorm on Lake Passaquani in New Hampshire in 1916. He was sheltered in a small cottage when he, in his own words, noticed, with what I can only describe as calm amazement, that a dazzling globe of electric fire, apparently between 6 and 12 inches in diameter, was stationary about 6 inches below and to the right of my right knee. As I looked at it, it exploded with a sharp report quite impossible to confuse with the continuous turmoil of the lightning, thunder, and hail, or that of the lashed water and smashed wood, which was creating pandemonium outside the cottage. I felt a very slight shock in the middle of my right hand, which was closest to the globe than any other part of my body. According to statistical investigations, ball lightning has been seen by roughly 5% of the population on Earth. There's one eerie account from the great thunderstorm in Devon, England on the 21st of October, 1638. Four people died and approximately 60 suffered injuries during the severe storm. That's a hell of a storm, still remembered after almost 400 years. Witnesses at a church in Devon described an eight foot ball of fire striking and entering the church and nearly destroying it. The ball of fire allegedly smashed the pews and windows and filled the church with a thick, dark, foul smoke, reportedly stinking of sulfur. In 17th century England, they considered sulfur to be basically the devil's brand of cologne. The ball of fire reportedly split into two segments, one exiting through a window by smashing it open, the other disappearing somewhere inside the church. Because of the fire and the sulfur smell, contemporaries naturally explained the ball of fire as the devil or the flames of hell. Later, some blamed the entire incident on two people who'd been playing cards in the pews during the sermon. Their lack of attentiveness as audience members had apparently summoned God's wrath. That theory makes even more sense. The lightning balls have been reported to disperse in many different ways often suddenly vanishing, sometimes gradually dissipating, or being absorbed. Ball lightning sometimes goes out with a bang, occasionally popping, exploding loudly, or even with destructive force. 
A review of the available literature published in 1972 identifies the properties of a typical ball lightning event. Ball lightning frequently appears almost simultaneously with cloud to ground lightning discharge. It's generally spherical or pear shaped with fuzzy, sometimes undefined edges. Their diameters range from half to several inches, most commonly four to eight inches or around 10 to 20 centimeters. A wide range of colors has been observed, red, orange, and yellow being the most common. The lifetime of each event is from one second to over a minute with the brightness remaining fairly constant. They tend to move at a few meters per second, most often in a horizontal direction, but may also move vertically, remain stationary, or sometimes wander erratically. Many are described as having rotational motion. It is rare that observers report the sensation of heat, although in some cases the disappearance of the ball is accompanied by the liberation of heat. Some display an affinity for metal objects and may move along conductors, such as wires or metal fences. Some appear within buildings, passing through closed doors and windows. Some have even appeared within metal aircraft and have entered and left without causing damage. The disappearance of a ball is generally rapid and may be either silent or explosive. Odors resembling ozone, burning sulfur, or nitrogen oxides are often reported at the scenes. There is at present no widely accepted explanation for ball lightning. Some speculate there is a relationship to other phenomena, such as St. Elmo's fire, where the sharp metallic edges of moving objects begin to glow purple at the surface. St. Elmo's fire can occur in aircraft, fixtures on ships, and on the buckles of the saddles of horses in dry weather during a ride. Japanese folklore offers a potential explanation. Hitodama, the Japanese word meaning human soul, are balls of fire that are mainly float in the middle of the night. They are said to be souls of the dead that have separated from their bodies. Scientists have made many attempts to produce ball lightning in the laboratory with varying results. Nikola Tesla reportedly could artificially produce inch-sized glowing orbs using high voltages. He even conducted some demonstrations of this ability. He dazzled a few audiences and even had it documented by newspaper reporters. Tesla eventually got bored with creating plasma balls. He was really interested in higher voltages and remote transmission of power. Tesla considered the lab-created light balls just a curiosity. That guy must have had some interesting things going on in his lab to get bored with ball lightning. With fairly minimal effort, the Vanadium audience could create a miniature ball lightning storm in a normal household microwave oven. To get started, place a burning match on a glass or ceramic plate. Cover the match with a glass jar turned upside down. Let the flame die out, then place the whole plate jar match combo in the microwave on high. Make sure it's rotating. The burnt portion of the match will flare up into a large ball of glowing plasma floating near the top of the jar. Strange and surprising things can happen when hot gas meets the electric fields generated in a microwave oven. Microwaves are wonderful, versatile instruments, but be careful with this one. There's expanding gas, so always the small potential for explosion. Safest thing would be to search it on YouTube and check out the countless awesome demonstrations of this plasma effect. You can achieve the same effect with other stuff other than matches, like grapes and aluminum foil. Science isn't meant for just scientists. It's meant for everyone. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.